Regina George is not cool. She's a life ruiner. A revenge party, a party that ends with somebody crushed and alone. They want me to have lunch with them all week. <laughs> Wow, are you trying to make the rest of us feel dumb? I'm not trying to, it's just happening. <laughs> you can't sit with us. Whatever, I'm getting cheese fries. Can you all join me in welcoming the cast of Mean Girls on Broadway to the stage? Yo, hey, <laughs> hi everyone. Welcome, awesome. Hi. Hey everybody, my name is Joel Newman. As I mentioned before, we're here with the cast of Mean Girls on Broadway. So before we get started, for those of you uh, who haven't seen the film, let me give you a quick recap of the film and the, and the play. So uh, unless you have been living under a rock, you probably know that Mean Girls the musical is based off the 2004 cult classic by Tina Fey of the same name. Mean Girls tells the story of Katie Heron, a teenager who moves from the African savanna to the suburbs of Illinois, where she has to learn to navigate the new world of high school hierarchy. The play follows Katie's attempts to find her place in the popularity pecking order and her struggle with the plastics, a trio of lionized fren frenemies led by the charming but ruthless Regina George. But when Katie devises a plan to end <laughs> Regina's reign, she learns the hard way that you can't cross a queen bee without getting stung. Uh, it's an awesome play for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, that was a really good synopsis. Oh, yeah, that is. Did you write Your that? PR people, they're right back there. Thanks, Google. Nice. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I think it'd be great if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves and sure. saying what part you play. Yes. Hi, I'm Erica Henningsen. I play Caddy. Hey guys, uh, my name's Renee Rapp and I play Regina. I'm Christina Alaplot. Oh my God. I am Christina Alabato and I play Gretchen Wieners. <laughs> I'm Kate Rockwell, I play Karen Smith. I'm Kyle Selig and I play Aaron Samuels. I'm Gray Henson and I play Damian Hubbard. Awesome. So I thought maybe a good way to start would be to talk a little bit about the show's trajectory. So I know, let's see, Erica, Kate, Gray, and Kyle, you guys have all been with the musical for quite a while now, right? You've been here pre-Broadway for sure, at least. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking maybe you could tell us a little bit about your journey with the show. How did you first get involved? And then I'd like to hear a little bit about how the show has changed over time, because yeah. obviously musicals and development take a long time, multiple years. So how has it evolved since it started to Broadway today? Well, Gray and I have actually been with it since it's literal very first out loud kind of anything we call, it's called a table read and it, we did um we kind of sit around in a circle and we're handed a script and we just literally read the words out loud for the first time and we only did act one it's like four years ago it was 2015 i was actually just looking at this the other day it was like june 1st of 2015 wow. um and whose house was it at was that somebody's house? No, it was at Casey's studio. Oh. And they just it's called like in right favors, here. basically. Yeah, basically I knew it was Casey like if you from Book of Mormon. And I knew Nell Benjamin, who's a lyricist, and she called me, but and then a bunch of people from um Kimmy Schmidt, Kimmy Schmidt were there reading because they were working on the TV show at the time. Uh -huh. Um some other people that Casey knew were there. So it was just a kind of a it had nothing really to do with the actual production of the piece as much as it was like, you understand this general kind of character. Can and you just Casey read it out loud? Nicola is the director. Yes, Casey yes. Nicola's the director. Um, and Tina Fey was there, and so was Jeff Richmond, who wrote the music. Um, so they kind of just listened to that out loud, and then, but it's it's basically like a thank you so much for your time, goodbye, we'll never see you again, usually. <laughs> well, Casey yeah. literally said, he's like, when we actually do this on Broadway, we're going to hire real teenagers. <laughs> None of you will be in role. it. Because, <laughs> like, I mean, I was, you know, we, I, we were in our late 20s, like, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, hey, sure, that's what I am. You look great. <laughs> My late 20s. <laughs> 
<laughs> but no, so he was like, so you're not going to, he was basically yeah. like, this, you will this, not get this not wrong. Yeah. Further, right? I was like, no, it's but, Tina Fey humor. Like it's adult humor. I mean, it's for kids, whatever, but we grew up with a movie. I, I knew that like high schoolers, apart from this 19 year old girl in front of me, like, re- you know what I mean? Like couldn't really like nail it the way that I think. Comedy and comedy is yeah. hard. Like yeah. comedy takes a, maturity. A, a, yeah, just an understanding of, of rhythm that comes from if you're, unless you're really lucky, that like comes from age. So I think that's why it's why we all got lucky enough to still be here. But we did that was a long time ago, and then we did there was a, one more reading, a full reading, a twenty of called a twenty nine hour reading, where basically it's a week of that same thing, but you add music in, and then we did what we call a lab or a workshop, which is four weeks of rehearsal where you basically put up a, a fake version of the show with fake set and no costumes and no any kind of technical element, but um, fully staged, choreographed. And that was in this that was in the spring of 2017. And then the fall of 2017, we and you were part of the lab. Yes, that's where I that's came. That's where Kyle Third place. <laughs> <laughs> and then for our out of town, which was in DC, fall of 2017, we acquired Erica. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then that was, that got us basically into the holiday season of 2017. Then we started the Broadway process in the spring of 2018. And now it's the fall it's of 2019. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. And how different is what you were doing, let's say like in DC versus what's on yeah. Wednesday? So the DC, the what we did in DC was called a pre-Broadway tryout, which was basically we mounted the show fully fully realized at the National Theater, but it wasn't in New York. So it didn't have the pressure of like New York critics coming down. Maybe some of them came, but it wasn't, it was listed as like, this is the pre-Broadway trial. It's still in development. It changed not just between DC and New York, but in DC, we were there for a month performing it. It changed so much. We had... I mean, we all had a, a ton of changes. I, simply because I operate as like the character who you see the story through, I just watch everything or I'm partaking in everything. There were like seven different versions of the opening number that we did night after night. And we tried on Tuesday, be in rehearsals on Wednesday with the new lyrics, put those lyrics in on Wednesday night, scrap those, show up on Thursday morning for rehearsal, new lyrics, put those in. Um, there was a night where Gray sang a duet with me that never existed <laughs> after that evening. So it was just kind of, um, it was kind of insane. It was all over the place. And I think that happens when you have somebody like Tina who works in television so she can write like lightning fire she's she's in the audience watching it one night and if something doesn't land or something doesn't work she has six other versions ready to go just from sit writing on her notepad that evening and when would you guys get these revised scripts the next morning to do that night usually Usually. And we were doing those changes for like 2,000 people for the first time that night. You just forget the audience is yeah. there at a certain point. Yeah. You're like, we would, you don't matter. I just really. have to say the right words tonight. Well, I would, so I opened the show with a picture of George Michael that Damien holds and he sings with. And every day in previews, we would have new lyrics for the very beginning of the show. And so I'd write my lyrics on the back of George Michael. <laughs> Because I was like, I, I do not know what I'm saying today. That's and what I always say. If you ever see a Broadway show in previews, remember this conversation because you are seeing actors and dancers doing a dance number they have never done before well, until a, that afternoon. So it is an interesting too. process. It was the script that was changing, but also the score was changing. The choreography was changing. I mean, we went through... The, the opening sequence is such a good example because there were nine different songs, not just lyrics, but like melody lines and how things were cut together. And at one point we had her parents and then we cut her parents and then there was a big fight sequence and then we cut the fight sequence and then we put her parents back, but they were singing something else. And I mean, just the whole number was new every single night. And, and for reference, this is also all just Washington, D.C. And right. then we did it again once we came to New York to do it on Broadway. Uh-huh. Again, like changes that morning, we do it for a New York audience on Broadway for the first time. <laughs> How long would previews generally be on Broadway? Um, I think um, both times we did six weeks. Oh. Um, oh. But also in D.C., we yeah. opened the show and then went back into previews for the last two weeks of our. So it was always like, this is not the version that uh, we're going to land with. We still have more work to do. Mm. Also, Different songs like uh, Death by a Million Cuts, just a million tiny little changes. Also. If you see the tour, the tour is also different uh, from the yeah, that's version. True. <laughs> and the tour just opened. Yes. And the tour mm-hmm. just opened. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Wow. So looking at where you guys started, I guess, or even DC to Broadway, like beyond songs changing here and there, were there big 
sort of thematic changes, or was it really just, yeah, switch number here and there, joke didn't land, let's replace it? I would say I, I, I think we all experience a lot of changes. I felt a very large amount because if you are familiar with the movie, Katie um, has voiceovers. She has the ability, you can see what she's going through from a close-up, from a voiceover, from a really close cut to just like this part of her face. You can't do that on a massive Broadway stage, especially in a massive Casey Nicola musical. So when we were in DC, the biggest thing we were dealing with was how do we make Katie an agent of her story and not a recipient, if that makes sense. It was like things were just kind of happening to her and she wasn't really the engine behind any of it. Um, or we didn't know how she felt about it. So that was the biggest thing for me that changed and I think it's still something that they kept retooling in the tour of how do we make this character that in the movie we can make her we can empathize with her because we can zoom in so close to her but how do we do that on a Broadway stage when she is surrounded by 25 dancers working their butts off and a huge orchestra and lights and everything like that um so that that was a big thing and I think thematically we can all probably talk about this about um how it was updated in terms of like it went from it was a movie of the early 2000s and now it's a movie of gen z yeah. for sure <laughs> yeah yeah and <laughs> speaking specifically of my role the love interest for this girl it became about how do we make it very 2019 where this girl like doesn't necessarily need to fall in love at the end. how do we make the whole story not about that and what it turned into was there was a version of the show where we like didn't end up together it happened for like one night or it happened in rehearsals right before we like took the show to tech yeah. and i remember specifically tina coming up to me being like i don't know if we're gonna stick with this because you know people are paying 200 dollars. they should probably kiss at the end you know what i mean like, um but just finding the balance of a thousand different issues like that that are you know very uh, topical in 2019 and finding the right balance. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Christina and Renee, these guys have been with the show for a long time. Mm -hmm. You guys are much more recent additions. Christina, I think you're April. Yes, I started um, in March. Of, March. Yes, yeah, okay. so I've been in the show for six months. Um, I replaced the original Gretchen Wieners. So I'm Gretchen Wieners number two. Um, <laughs> or number three. 3.0 because Lacey's 1.0, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and Renee, you like joined very, very recently. September, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Just a couple weeks ago. Yes. So what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, did I? I don't, yes. So I? what is it like jumping on? This is a, a moving train with right. a well-oiled machine, a lot of history. What has that been like for you guys? Um, you know, for me, honestly, it was a, it was a really, really big change to what I was doing in life before. Um, but also, like, I was last year I guess right I don't know the clock is all wrong you guys but like last year I was living in high school so then to do a show which right it's it is almost comedic I'm like <laughs> yes um but you know to go into a show that takes place in high school now um I think there were there were a lot of really hard things to to deal with because I I do not have the experience and like the expertise that these guys do honestly but also the advantage and the thing that I've found most um helpful is that they are all literal experts at what they're doing so I'm learning from them literally every night sitting sitting here listening to them talk right now I'm like yeah guys I'm like, <laughs> that's amazing like keep going like, tell me more. Renee has taught us so much oh about being a Gen Z <laughs> yes. I've learned like, so many words from her Instagram. she speaks yeah. a different language she really she does <laughs> all the words are familiar but they're in a totally different order than I know them to exist in she we've learned in, a lot she from came you. in the first week and was like Oh, that slaps. And Eric and I looked at I each know. other. And we're like, <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? Do you guys like, know what that means? Do you know the best thing means? about having you is slaps. like, you're true. You have the confidence of some, like, a of true Regina George, but none of the the bite in your real life, and Thank that's the girl. thing where I just think if you haven't seen Mean Girls in a while, or if you like haven't seen it at all, come see it, and also because you'll get to see Renee because she just started, and it's like it's insane. She's <laughs> awesome, <laughs> but it's it's a really nice place to you know when you were placed in a Broadway show, it is a machine that you kind of like get on while it's still going. Um, yeah. So it definitely takes. Um, 
a lot of focus for us and yeah. also trying to to meld in but also be our own authentic version of those characters mm -hmm. within something that exists already um but this company specifically and the people that taught us our roles were so good at allowing us to find our own way into these characters and then the company behind us all these people on stage and and the our entire cast and crew at the theater is so welcoming of new energy and for new people sure. and so it really it was i mean easy like oh yeah just an easy transition for both of us as new newer company members yep. was, it, was yeah. it intimidating because you were both stepping into some pretty big shoes and christina park taylor louderman those were big names what was it like to to come into those roles yeah you know for for me i had known ashley um before like um, ashley park who i replaced she and i were friends before so i texted her and she was so excited that i got it so it was a very um sweet transaction for us because we had known each other for many years and so it was really cool to have that experience with her and um i this i've done I've replaced once before in a Broadway show and then I originated a Broadway show in 2016 or 15. So I, I knew what, what I was coming into, you know what I mean? So intimidating, of course, because we can never replace the people that we're replacing. We're, you know, and I think if you go into it thinking about it that way is yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's a dumb, it's like, it's like being a, a different, your own version of how you perceive their, um, roles in the show and like I I was I mean like I'm a fan of all of the people who are sitting right next to me like I'm I'm a fan first like I still go to work and it's like I'm like going to a club where the bouncer's like you shouldn't be here but I'm like trying really hard and I'm like no I need to and he's like okay fine go ahead <laughs> yeah right um but you know like I was a fan of all of these guys mm -hmm. and Taylor too you know so I'm it was really intimidating in the sense that like wow these guys are all really really good at what they do and I have no clue what I'm doing but we'll just like wing it um but they're so supportive that it, the intimidation kind of just like fizzles out and it just becomes more of like this like grateful feeling to be a part of the family you know I will say too that we're really lucky in this show because we don't expect we don't want anyone to come in and do carbon copy of what, just like we right. were not expected to come in and be carbon copies yeah. of the Movie. film actors. Like mm -hmm. no one ever asked me to be Amanda Seyfried and do things like Amanda Seyfried did. Um, we we sort of process the new people that come in and take over in our show the same way, which is we want you to do it your way. Yeah. And that goes all the way, I mean, Tina and Casey and everybody um, on the creative side, but also us on stage. I, I, want, I want us to build our own f friendship and inside jokes and comedy timing and, yeah. and stuff because I don't want to be replicating what we did before. I want us to have our own version and I want us to have our own version. And, and that's true across the board. Everybody is, is encouraged and to do it their way because that's what makes a show come alive. And that's what makes comedy funny is, is truth and, and honesty. And yeah. if you try to force square peg into round hole, just for the sake of making it the same, um, which look, there are plenty of machines out there that do that. Ours is not that way. And I think that's one of the yeah. reasons that, it's just as joyful now as it was when we first opened with a totally different company of people. Yes. Makes total sense. Yeah. Um, well, I can testify that you were absolutely, you both were absolutely amazing. Thank um, you. But maybe a great way of showing it would be uh, for you to have <gasps> you sing your first number. Now that you bring into the. I stan you, Renee. I stan you, too. Christina. I never get to watch you sing this. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. It's a. Uh, <laughs> it's, wild. it's wild. Get ready. Let's see. Hey guys. <laughs> How's it going? Got it. Yes, I look perfect. Ice queen, that's what he it's what they all expect from me But it's all shit Face it, use me You saw the sexy clothes My supermodel pose What did you know? Was I a game to you? Was I a way to be cool? I truly can
someone gets hurt. Till someone gets hurt. Self-defense I thought you had the sense To see through that Was I too proud of you? Was I too cold and forbidding? That you chose her over me Are you kidding? Oh, I don't mean y'all trapped in this family show a full-on like bunny Halloween costume at the same wow. time. It's Giant insanity. <laughs> Y'all that carried around by six very attractive men. Yes. It's a very attractive man. But job. let me tell you, that corset, uh-uh. <laughs> it's tight. It is tight. Yes. So can I ask you, I mean, that is one of, there's what, like 20 plus numbers in this show? 265. How on earth? So many. <laughs> 265. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How on earth do you guys keep your voices in good enough shape to do this eight times a week? Are you on vocal rest any day? You're not singing? Do you have to do special training specifically for this kind of singing? How does it work? Uh, well, I think just for me, from um, going into the show, I, I, I have never done... Um, a show really before I mean like I did stuff in high school of course but like that's like a weekend run of like three shows and I actually notice now um because Regina doesn't have uh much of a, a vocal track that is like hit it hit it hit it keep going like there's I have some good downtime during the show I I snack a lot but um <laughs> but and then of course it doesn't fit but um yeah so I've found that actually being in the show every night, I feel like I'm in better vocal shape than I have ever been in my whole life. And I'm not, I, I think it's just because like, you know, you're using like your full range every night. Um, so yeah, yeah, you build up stamina, just like, you know, you go to the gym and work out, so you're gonna be stronger. Um, but I mean, there are some days when like, I'm like, uh -uh, not today, not today. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I feel like it, it keeps you in really good vocal shape for this track specifically. Yeah. I think there, I mean, there are so many tricks and stuff that we all use with yeah. between like steaming and tea and all that. And we could talk about that for hours. I feel like everybody's regimen is a little different. For me, the biggest thing was learning how to talk properly because it's high school, so we feel everything, and I'm like a very nervous character in the show who wears a backpack, so I spend the whole first act like this, just like, oh my God, there's so much happening. And I was noticing that there was so much tension in my, in all over my body, so I ended up doing like a, a bunch of speech therapy as I opened the show on Broadway because the singing was not the hardest part. It was yelling over the music. It was, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're yelling. It's, I, I don't know if it's because it's high schoolers. You're just very much like, life is so dramatic right now. So you feel yeah. the need to push sometimes. Um, but it was figuring out a way to keep the energy up, but to not bring it so much into my voice 
into my speaking voice because that's what was making me lose my voice. I mean, we are ultimately vocal athletes. Like, you know, we people talk. I'm I'm not an athlete in anything else, (laughs) Um, but I we train vocally the same way that a, a marathon runner trains for the marathon or a sprinting runner trains for sprints or people who jump hurdles or whatever other people do. I don't know. Um, we train for it and we know our voices inside and out and our bodies are our instruments. And so we are very, very aware of every minute change. I mean, just listening to you talk about that is so funny because the, the notion that you were aware that there was tension coming from shrugging your shoulders is something that like vocalists just know we understand and we work our butts off to make sure we understand so that we can show up eight times a week and do, and, and there, there are people who make the choice to go on vocal rest when they're outside of their work some jobs require it I mean I don't know any alphabet that's ever like gone out partying after a show because it's just too much but um part of the job in addition to singing every night is coming out and representing your show and marketing your show and so like there isn't really an off time you have to learn how to maintain your job at night and give the performance that is deserved and and expected by the audience and then also go out and do the rest of your life as well otherwise there's no long-term plan if you hold yourself up in a room outside of doing the show you you have to learn how to be how to have a sustainable lifestyle um not just your job but also everything that comes with it and to speak to the other side of that it's a lot of it I find is a mental game. It's about, Agreed. Right. it's about if you go into the show thinking, Oh my God, there's eight this week. And like, I'm already tired. You're little, my shoulders are up, you know, like that's, that's part of it. So it's about finding this balance for yourself, which is healthy in, in multiple ways than one. Yeah. And how about, is it the same for dancing? Cause this show also has a ton of right. dancing and I don't think I've ever seen like musical leads dancing the entire show. Okay, Gray, I did not know. I got to watch the show like six months ago. Just I was out one night back from vacation and I got in time to see it and I watched from the spot booth and I did not realize how much Gray Henson dances in our Ray, show. It's amazing. It is uh, insanity. Also, I, he has a knee injury. Yeah. Explain. Well, I have. <laughs> Thank you. Er- thanks, Erica. Um, how? How? I don't understand how you're doing it. Well, I play the gay role in the show, so of course he dances the whole time. <laughs> um, no, I did Book of Mormon before this, and I I did I played Elder McKinley, the gay role in that show. So, lol, LOL. call me for all your gay needs. But <laughs> I did. Well, I that's on the- that's on the internet now. <laughs> right. You're gonna call get some me calls. For your gay needs. <laughs> Business card. Yeah, oh, that's, call me really, for that's a good <laughs> tagline. No, I did Book of Mormon and I did a tap dance. I played Elder McKinley. I sang Turn It Off in that show. And so I did that with Casey Nicola, the first national tour. And so he knew I could tap. And so Stop, the tap number that we opened the second act with, was added into the Broadway show after DC. And so, because he knew I could do it. And so he just threw me that tap dance. And then it has kind of become a dance role. I started dancing when I was three years old, but no one expects me to dance because I'm like six foot three and built like a linebacker. So, like, <laughs> I think that's why it's like impressive and it's fun. And also I, I've made dances out of where there were no dances in the yes. show. Like, yeah, chose um, this dance. But yeah, and, yeah, but it's fun. I mean, that's what's that's what's the uh, the be- the best part of the show for me is like t- leading a tap dance on Broadway as like a gay teen um, who's not a teenager anymore. It, it is. I will say when I saw the show before I went in, I saw it and I actually had my dad with me one night and my dad is now Gray's literal biggest fan in the whole wide world because he originally didn't you know know that much about theater so we go to see Mean Girls and of course like they are all so impressive it's sickening but Gray comes out in the middle of act two and my dad has been like deadpan silent this whole time and Gray starts tapping and my father (laughs) just like lights up like a Christmas tree he's like yes he's like he's like he's like this guy can move and he's like speaking audibly which you're not supposed to do in a theater and he's like going Doesn't he off coach football like that's his oh my gosh he's coached like basketball so- like he's like you know what he said told me after the show was like i just oh, want to yeah. put a football on you yeah. It was so funny, but it was, it's amazing. It is amazing what he does. Like, uh, I mean, we all do pretty cool stuff in the show, but yeah, I guess I'm the dancer of the show. That's so weird. 
answer. There's a lot of ensemble yeah. members yeah. that are really upset with this yeah. conversation. Honestly, <laughs> there are 25 a- dancers also in the show that are oh, no, here but right Your now. question was, how do you physically stay up? Uh, uh, right. Whatever. Um, I, yeah, I do have like a knee thing. I have like a back thing. But uh, the dancers in the ensemble of the show dance the entire time. And oh, my God. So we have Two physical therapy every week at the theater. So we have a physical therapist that comes, and you can sign up for slots, and you go in and just kind of work. Uh, you do tune-up stuff. And people take classes if if that, that helps them. Um, it, it's a lot of rest for me, actually, um, to get through eight shows a week. Because it's, you know, it's your job. You wake up every morning, you're like, can I sing? Can I dance? How's my body? So I can do that thing later on tonight, you know? Yeah, and it is like a, I dance a little in the show too, and I, I tried getting into a workout regiment that I could do, and I remember I I was trying to do like squats or something, and I jump a lot in the section of the show that I dance. In heels. And I, I regretted it immediately. I was like, I so I, I'm still even six months in trying to figure out how to give my body what it needs, but also be able to do the show. Um, cause I was so sore that I had a hard time jumping at full. Like I was like, Oh, that was such a mistake. Not never again, never again. So it is, it is like a trial and error a little bit too. And in this show, especially everybody's jobs are so different. Like the things that I need to get through my show because of my physicality are so are the exact opposite of like what gray needs for his physicality. Like we, there is no one thing in this particular show that's good for everyone because everyone is doing a completely different... We all have our own tone. Like, everybody has their own, literally, music tones, but also, like, character, physicality, everything. So it's it's really varied. Yeah. Got it. So pivot a little bit from sort of some of the logistical stuff to, I guess, maybe some of the deeper elements of the show. I think everybody knows Mean Girls as a comedy, obviously. Tina Fey's book, hilarious. But it actually does deal with some deeper topics around insecurity, bullying, finding your place. Um, which of those, I guess, how do those themes resonate with you? And uh, Christina, maybe I can go to you in terms of your character, particularly she's really sort of at Regina's beck and call, tons of insecurity. Um, how does that resonate with you or yeah. how do you find that character? You know, it was interesting auditioning for Gretchen because that, you know, even in the film, she, she does want to be liked so much and I think that all and accepted and um she wants Regina to want her which I mean I think we all have experienced that whether it's you know um auditioning for a show for us or or applying for a job or wanting that from your partner or a friend and so it was very easy to tap into the song that I sing in the show what's wrong with me which is what I auditioned with because it is just something that not only did I think about a lot in high school and I think we all probably did but still do as a as an adult at at all times just checking in with like am I enough is this enough am I good enough and so I think that that's a lot of young people reach out to me in particular and I'm sure other people, but about feeling that way. I get a lot of letters and stuff on social media about like, I don't feel adequate enough in school. This song I connect with so much, like it's made me want to be stronger. It made, it's made me want to love myself more. And I don't know that Gretchen gets there in the show, but I, I always believe that when the show's done, Gretchen gets there. She, she, she hears it for herself, but um, I do think that that really resonates to the young people that see our show, specifically that song and Katie's journey too, and wanting to be enough and fit in and she makes bad decisions and then she figures it out, which is good too. So would you mind giving everybody a little taste? Of- <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I will sing my song. What's wrong with me for you? Um, this right is one now. of the original ones from the very beginning too. Yeah. That's, that's been with the project from the very beginning. Also, Gretchen is Tina's favorite character. Oh. <laughs> Just tip it. Don't mess it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you never do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what's wrong with me, my body, face, my hair. Tell me all my many faults. Tell me like you care when we both know you're cruel and we both know you're right. I could listen to you like a fool all night. What's wrong with me? How I speak, how I dress, what's wrong? Mama called me beautiful, don't believe her anymore. Now I'm listening to you, what do I do that for? Please don't ignore me. Mm -hmm. Tell me who we hate. 
today and I will fall in line hug me while my shoulders tense and we'll pretend we're fine though we both know one day there'll be blood on the floor but which one will betray the other What can I do? What's wrong with me? Could it be you? It's probably me. See that you see. What's wrong with me? Lovely, a um, little sad. Yes. <laughs> so to lighten things up, I'm sure you, one of the things you guys get asked about all the time um, is obviously Tina Fey's association with this show. She's a, an amazing writer, but I know she's been heavily involved with the show both since its development, but I, I understand still to this day. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have funny stories about working with her or what's working with her been like in general? <laughs> I think about I think about a lot the day. She, she was with us every single day, every moment of the entire development process. She is not the person who like put her name on this and then ran away. She didn't even just like write the script and run away. Like she was there all day, every day with us, um, all the way through award season, all the way through all of that work that we had to do, you know, with the show. And then, um, she still comes and raises money for Broadway cares, which is a, our big Broadway charity. Um, every time we do our buy our, what is it when you do it twice a year? Um, fundraiser, she's there auctioning off herself and <laughs> her time. Um, but I think when I think about like what it's like to work for her, I think of like two specific little stories. One was the, when we first got into the studio and she would sit at the table in the front and we would start rehearsing scenes and like the, the deep dark pit of fear, that goes through you when you have to make Tina Fey's jokes for Tina Fey. And the moment that she cracked and laughed for the first time that we saw her laugh at our show for the first time. And it wasn't even like a joke line. It was something else that she saw. I don't even remember who it was. I remember being like, Oh, th there's literally nothing better in the world than making Tina Fey laugh. Nothing <laughs> can make you feel better. And then this, the second story is when we did our album release, uh, the first time we listened to our cast album. Um, and so Jeff Richmond is her husband and he wrote the music and it was, this is his first musical as well as hers. And, um, we, we all got to go to Atlantic Records who produced our album. We went to one of their spaces and listened to it out loud. And there's like sandwiches and, you know, wine and whatever. It's like 11 o'clock at night. And um, Tina got up and started doing the raps to the songs. Do you remember this? She got up with Demar Demarius, who was in our one of our ensemble, original ensemble guys. And they started like just like performing the whole scene for everybody. And it like was just like up doing like a lip sync battle with Demarius <laughs> to our own cast album, our musical theater cast album. Um, and then at the very end of the show, at the very end of that uh, listening party, if you like sort of like caught at the corner of your eye, her and Jeff, like her just celebrating him and his work. Like she's the most loving and joyful human being and she's so supportive and so encouraging of all of us and of him and of her own stuff and it like it was just an, she's like the best boss you could ever ask for um it's really it's really it's inspiring and it's it's kind of astonishing to work for someone as as celebrated as she is and and to feel like it's every single aspect of that is deserved and, and worth it maybe even more yeah, she was heavily involved in our casting process as well. So it's it's amazing. You know, sometimes those creators will step away because they have a billion other things to do. And right. Tina Fey is the queen of doing a billion things. And she cast me and Renee, and yeah. she was there. And I remember leaving the room, and same thing. I was like, she laughed once. I'm good. I don't even care. <laughs> yeah, literally, I was like, I'm good. Um, but she, it, she's so giving of her time, which is incredible because we all say we're so busy, we're so busy, we're so busy. But Tina Fey is never too busy to to show up for us, no. it's really incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, baby. Oh, I, I'm a huge 30 Rock fan, and so I knew, like, every episode of that TV show. Like, I could quote them all, seriously, before I met her, so I was freaking out. But I, she's nothing like Liz Lemon, and I think everyone, people sort of assume she will be, because yeah. it seems so natural for her, but she's definitely, like, quiet, and she kind of whispers, and you have to, like, lean in, and she's like, oh, is that funny? What, like, what are you saying? Right? <laughs> 
Yeah, she like is nothing like that character. I remember being so shocked, but she loves talking about 30 Rock. And so uh, you, I, I would like bring up, I'm like, oh my God, that one episode that reminds me of this. And she'd be like, oh, that was a funny one, huh? That was a funny one. <laughs> She's obsessed with it. Yeah, there was yeah. like something. I was like sweating in rehearsal one day, and you does anyone like love Thirty Rock? Does anyone like know that show? Yeah, there was like one moment in it when she's like looking in the mirror before she's going out, and she's like sweating, and she's like, "Stop sweating, you stupid bitch!" And, like that's what she says to herself. And I was like, "I'm like you in that episode." She's like, "That was so funny. That was so funny." <laughs> She loves it, you know, and that she's so proud of it. And she like loves theater. She's like a theater nerd. And like for opening night, she gave Barrett, who plays Janice, like a picture of her in like cabaret from like college or something. Like really. Your your story. I just want to make sure we have a chance to open up the mics if people in the audience uh, have questions as well. So maybe we can file up to the mics um, while you tell us your Tina story. Oh well, no, I was just gonna say, going along with what you guys are saying, um, the first time that I I met and sat down with Tina and we were talking i i don't know i didn't really ex- there were no expectations i guess i should say like in in a very like my new okay this is like tina fey and i'm like sitting there i'm like yeah what the hell am i doing here you know what i mean but when i talked to her i, I had just moved to new york on my own i think i i was probably like just turned 19 and i was terrified to be quite honest and i have never felt so comfortable and so like metaphorically hugged by another human being in my entire life and she just gave me validation that like I was on my own path and like I was doing the right thing without knowing me through Adam except auditioning for her and I was like oh cool this lady is like amazing she just she made me feel so good at a time where she probably didn't know that I needed it but I needed it so badly and she gave that to me and it was a huge huge part of my life Awesome. Just very, very simple story. It was my birthday on Saturday, and she sent me a plant. Oh, yeah, I was fishing. Thank you, thank you. (laughs) And she sent me a plant, and she's, like, in the midst of mounting a whole other production of this show in Buffalo, and, like, she still sent me a plant, which is... She sent me a plant, too. Oh, okay, so it's a thing she did. Okay. (laughs) No, no, I meant it in a good way. Like, she said... It's so sad. Remember people's birthdays. Like, what boss does that so specifically for every person? She's awesome. I think that, and I want to talk to other actors that she's worked with. I will say there's something, and Tina's been honest with us about this. Tina grew up wanting to do musical theater. Like, she, and it's so funny because we are, you know, I still find myself being like, oh my God, she's okay, she's in the room. Okay, be cool, be cool, be cool. Like, I still feel nervous around her, even though we've spent every day with her for a very long time. Um, but I realized the other day when we saw, we got to watch the tour production and we got to be sort of generation one saying goodbye to generation two of, of Mean Girls. And she was also there. And it was this moment where I, where I thought, oh, we are, there's such a mutual gratitude and appreciation for what we each do. We admire her so much, but it is really special to feel that your boss and this person who is, it's Tina it's Tina frickin' Fay. Like, she's a she's the one we bow down to. But she feels very fortunate to have us tell her story every night. And that's, like, the privilege that you you kind of forget. And it is a really awesome thing that she's made that relationship feel so strong. I just admire her so much for that. Yeah. I just want to add to that also. There's this section of her book, Bossy Pants, where she talks about um, what got her through working on 30 Rock. And it's about how she was responsible for a bunch of people's jobs. She was the boss of this show for everyone else. And I think, I, I mean, you think of boss and you think somebody who's in charge and and potentially out for themselves, doing it for them. Mm-hmm. And with Tina, you, you, we get the sense on this show that she has made the show for a bunch of kids boss, yeah. to be employed, which is <laughs> an amazing quality in a boss and should be the only quality for a boss. You know? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So I think... Um, we probably have time for one last question because I know we have one more musical number. Um, but this show is obviously, a, the, the movie and the show is a cult classic and it is known for lots of famous one-liners. So I'm interested to know if all, each of you has a favorite one-liner and if, there is a num- if there's a one-liner in the show that everybody in the audience is just waiting for. Like just erupts, or does it, cha- does it change from night to night? Because there was definitely like one line, not family appropriate. Um, on Saturday, the audience just- Do we have down. to censor? Can we not say things? 
too late now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was doing well for a while, and then I just let it, and I was like, okay, whatever. Well, there's, I mean, people start laughing before Gray stands up to say she doesn't even go here because they see him in the yes. back, in the blue hoodie, Waiting in the glasses, and they're like, it's coming, it's coming. Yes, literally. It's literally. so funny because that is the easiest line I have to say. You do nothing. I just say, she doesn't even go here. And it's like, done. But but Damien has a lot of them, actually. Like, yeah. you go Glenn Coco is in the show, and her hair is full of secrets is in the show. And yep. I don't know, what are the, and like, um, the Regina, you know, like, whatever, I'm getting cheese fries and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. And we have, we have um, your hair looks sexy pushed back, which is actually more a plot point, so it actually doesn't, like, get laughs at it. <laughs> like, yeah. you think it would. It's like, oh, sexy pushback, but it's actually, like, a really dark moment it's in the show. It's very intense. A little bit. Yeah. So it's... But also, they, do, they actually did what I sort of marvel at is that a lot of the one-liners that we have in our show that are from the movie that are famous are not joke lines. They're not laugh lines. Right. Because it's actually not funny to say something that you already know the joke. You know the punchline of the joke. Like, the is audience there? is so far ahead. So, like, the one that we toyed with for months, I mean, on and off and on and off, is if you're from Africa, why are you white? Because it's so famous, and it's this you know, probably one of the most iconic Karen lines. But if I start to say, if you're from Africa, the audience will go, why are you white? Because everyone knows it and it's not funny anymore. <laughs> yeah. So like we had to eventually draw a lot of the things that we chose to keep in kind of outside of she doesn't even go here are plot point lines that are famous. I mean, we still obviously we have that so fetch, like, fetch yeah. but it's just a part of the scene. It's just a Somebody moment. Laughs at it. It's not like the audience. We're not asking the audience to get up and scream and they don't because they don't. It's, the scene is happening. But so a lot of them, are, a lot of them, they're there and you get to enjoy them and hear them. And Glenn Coco is, is maybe be the biggest one actually <laughs> yeah. so we'll get some so musical good. moment so that's uh that's pretty celebrated <laughs> so good. i feel like that's why i mean oh, there are a bunch of movie musicals now that just happens and i feel like what tina did and what our team did best is that they didn't just put this put the screenplay on a table and shove songs into it she totally reworked the screenplay and a lot of that were the jokes and she found jokes yep. that were if you we didn't think they could be better and they're better yeah <laughs> yeah Awesome. Well, oh, I, I do could... miss Shave Your Back by Jason. <laughs> I know, I love that. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> uh, well, I could ask you guys questions all day, but uh, we are running out of time, so maybe we have one more. Oh my goodness, Erica, one thing more for us, Erica. Thing is also, on. I have to ask you, where did you get your shirt from? Uh, me? Dogecoin. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it as soon as I sat down. She loves dogs. Erica likes dogs. She loves dogs. <laughs> uh, this is the song that Katie sings at Spring Fling after she's won the crown. Cheap, fake, easy to break. That's how I used to be. Here, take it. Now I'm awake. I'll tell you what I see. Plastic don't shine. Glitter don't shine. Rhinestones don't shine the way you do. You are so real. You are so rare. I see you there. I see you. I see stars. So many stars tonight. You could make diamonds dull. You are so beautiful. I see stars. You shine as bright as day. I will look out for you. We'll light each other's way. You're What's my problem? I don't be frightened like me. The darker the night, the brighter you shine. Plastic don't shine, glitter don't shine. Rhinestones don't shine the way you do. You are on fire, you can rise higher. Up in the sky, enjoy the view. You could make diamonds dull. You are so beautiful. I see stars. You are real. And you are rare. I want to say I see you there. It's me and you, not us and her. Cause if we knew how strong we were, we'd say what we are. Stars! Say what you are. We're stars. You're a star. So many stars tonight. You could make diamonds tall. You are so beautiful. I see stars. Shine as bright as day I will look out
are so real. We are so real. We are so real.